beyond Fahrenheit. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Fadero Speaks, and I know that you're surprised that you see my face and not Fadero's, but he's taking today off, and we wish him rest peace and joy for today. Um, but we have people here who are ready to talk about racial inequality then and now. And I will introduce myself. My name is Delisha Gibson. I am one of the people on, and on the executive board of PWP, which is the under, um, umbrella, I'm sorry, of Federo Speaks. And um, also today, from our board of PWP, I have Miss Angela Ross. Miss Angela, can you introduce yourself to the people? Hi, I'm Angela Ross. Again, like Delicia said, I'm part of the board uh, for Paint the World. So welcome everyone. Yes. And we have Miss Tamara. Miss Tamara, can you introduce yourself to the people? Hi, I'm Tamara. It is so nice to be here today to discuss this very important topic, and I am just ready and excited to be here. All right, all right. And Mr. Antoine, can you introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. I am Antoine Johnson, been North Federal for quite some time, and this is my umpteenth panel discussion, and I'm ready for this one. All right, all right. And last but not least, and no introduction is needed, but we would ask that he would introduce himself. Hey, everybody. I'm Darren Calhoun, joining from Chicago, as always. Pronouns are he, him, and I uh, frequently find myself uh, having conversations about race, justice, and the intersections of gender, faith, uh, LGBTQI identity experience, all the fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to today. today. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here and everyone who is viewing it. We thank you for viewing it and being here with us as we discuss this. Uh, we're not trying to cover everything because we almost can't, um, but we're just trying to touch the surface um, because racial inequality then and now is a part of our culture right now. It's a part of our language. It's, it's embedded into everything that is existing in our lives, especially as African Americans. And so I just want to go over a few points to bring out and that we're going to tackle today. And again, it all started with slavery, of course, in 1619. And then we had a injustice system um, that was, it was called slave by another name because this was the time frame when we um, had the 1865 um, emancipation. And however, the South decided to enslave free people. Um, and they had them working in the coal mines. They had them working in the steel mills. And so it was another, uh, from 1865 to 1945, another 40 or 50 more years that they were enslaved by being jail and still free labor. Um, then we move, we're going to move on to talk about and maybe touch bases about uh, the civil rights movement, of course, we cannot forget that from 1955 to 1968. Um, during that era, of course, Jim Crow, um, and especially the war on drugs. Um, we've had four or five presidents who have uh, signed into law. You know, it's, it's something to say something about uh, the war on drugs, but when you sign something into law, that means that someone is going to suffer, and unfortunately, the Black population has suffered, where in 1970, it went from 250,000 people incarcerated uh, for drugs, now to 2.4 million, and 57% of that population is Black or Latino, so obviously, that inequality is still there then and now. And last but not least, well, we have two more subjects, police brutality. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's just said in its own self. Uh, of course, Black Lives Matter has been, uh, has tried to address that and bring that to light. And the last thing that I really fought to get on this, uh, this topic and this subject is human trafficking. Um, sometimes I think as Black people, we don't see and understand that human trafficking is modern day slavery. And it is a problem, it's an issue. And I hope and pray that one day that it will be 
uh, eradicated and it will be snuffed out. So we're gonna start by talking about racial inequality and disparities. And as I stated before, we can't tackle everything, but we want to start with a few things. So I'm going to start with Tamara, and I'm going to ask you what areas of inequalities still exist in the present day that we're fighting for since post-slavery, in your opinion? Well, it's a very sensitive subject because, you know, sometimes I just tend to want to blind myself from it at times just to just to continue to have what I have and try to make it make make it by in this, in this inequality of every system we're dealing with. It's in a workplace, um, it's in a government, it's in it's in a housing, it's in it's in every place of your life. There's not a place of your life that you don't have the the, the inequality that is is actually just blatant. Um, but it's a way that they put certain rules and um, certain type of um, certain rules and certain things that they put implement and say, okay, we're going to do this for our black community or we're going to have this program, you know, just to help our black community out and our minorities out. And so they kind of bind band-aid it and then we have to take it in order to just, to, you know, just to make it in the U.S. You know, yeah. so I it's a system where it is everywhere. There is not a place that I can say that I have not felt it um, or I've not seen it, especially with the social media platform being so uh, pertinent right now. It's like you can you wake up every day and you see it just by going on Instagram. Yes. So it is a very sensitive subject and it's, you know, it's everywhere and it, it's very sensitive. Yes, yes. And Darren, what, what are your feelings? I, I mean, we all are, are we're all African-Americans, so we're, we're seeing it. It's everywhere. You can't get around it and you can't get by it. Yeah, um, I think it's one of those things where um, if it's your experience, it's so ingrained to what you've experienced that you it's easier to, to almost not realize how many things are affected. And if it's not your experience, it's easy to go, oh, well, not everything's about race. Not everything is because of, quote unquote, the color of your skin. But then when you look at the systems and the laws and the ways things govern our society, you do see that um, that so much is different. Um, like you mentioned, the, the the wealth gap, which is always one of those measurements that it blows my mind every time. Mm -hmm. And for every, and I'm 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 gonna be a little liberal with the with the wording of it here, but essentially for every thousand dollars a white family has, average white family in America, the average black family in, in the U.S. has about two hundred dollars. And so just think about what what that happens as you multiply <laughs> those numbers out to more than, you know, a thousand dollars, you're like, wow. Now you may say, well, I've always worked hard and my family's worked hard or, you know, no one gave us handouts in my family. Why do black people expect handouts? It's like, this isn't about handouts. This is about having the same level starting place that, you know, it, there's a whole lot more you can you can do when you have a thousand dollars in the bank versus when you have two hundred dollars in the bank, yes. and for us to for us to engage in what it really means to get toward equality, we have to deal with topics like equity, um, or how do we fill in the gaps, and we have to deal with the parts where the history of what's happened to us, the context and the understanding of it are still actively being obscured. So I got some nuggets to, to share later, but um, right. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, okay, okay. And Ms. Angela, um, <clears throat> in, our, in your lifetime, have you seen advancements in any areas of racial inequalities? Um, I have, uh, like at my place of employment, uh, it is for, predominantly African-Americans and uh, 90, I would say a good 95% of that is uh, women in power. So I do see us uh, getting out there, stepping up, uh, coming out, so to speak. Uh, not like we've been here, but we've been 
we haven't hidden ourselves. We just been kept here. But I think we have fought to get to where we are today, mm -hmm. to be out in the forefront. So I think that's uh, one of the powerful things that I've seen. Yes. Thank you so much for that. And Antoine, um, a quick question for you, because it affects all of us. Um, but what has been the impact of these disparities on your family generationally? Generationally, because as Mr. Calhoun has said, the wealth gap, and if one person in the family gets $1 more than next, heads get too high and the family is divided. Or if you get a certain job and move to a certain area, move from the west side or south side of Chicago, move to Bellwood, which is just the west side of Chicago, you think you're up here. And because a lot of Black people never had too much money or we don't have investments, we don't have savings anymore, we don't have good credit, if we get a little bit more, we don't know how to act towards our own relatives. And we progress as far as financially, peer to um, living off of beans and cornbread. But because you're gonna fix you a steak, families think they're rich. They don't recognize they're not, they're still poor. Yes. I appreciate that because that that is, you know, we're going to deal with that a little later. Um, and I want to really try to touch base on that um, a little uh, later, but we're going to try to talk about that, that society driven, um, in a sense, genocide, that's what we're calling it, mm -hmm. because, you know, that effect has affected all of us generationally. Um, and it's, it's all like Tamara said earlier, it is in everything. Um, our education, our housing, um, transportation, employment. Um, so it affects everything. Um, but Darren, can you just touch that question a little bit? Because generationally, we are definitely affected in different ways because we are not where we're, our mothers were or our grandmothers were. You know, we moved the barometer a little bit, but is it justified movement? Is it really movement? Yeah, to to respond, like, we have so much going on. Um, when I think about, uh, when I think about how we told the stories of people like Dr. Martin Luther King, when I think about how we tell the stories of various civil rights leaders, um, I've been looking at how me growing up, I'm 42 years old, those seem like, oh, this is so far back in the past. And this was like from many generations ago. And if you hear people respond to what's happening with racism right now, you'll often hear them say, oh, that was so long ago, get over it. But um, I just heard this recently. If we think about some of our favorite celebrities right now, right? Like I could talk about Madonna, Denzel Washington, Jeff Goldblum, people we know, yes? Mm -hmm. What they share in common is that they're all in their 60s. Mm. Ruby Bridges, the first person to integrate schools and who we see the pictures of being escorted as a, as a very young child being escorted by federal agents into school because uh, white adults were willing to make death threats and you know uh, throw all kinds of things at her and just all this harassment. She's 67 years old. Mm. Mm. This is, we aren't talking about something that was years and we're talking about people who are in our same age group in our mm -hmm. same generations. And so like, there's this thing that we've been doing where we've collectively made civil rights history and, and the advancement. We've made this as something that was oh so long ago in our collective memory when really this is right now, <laughs> we're yeah. still living this, you know? Um, and uh, the, the idea that all this should be fixed by now. It's just like, no, this has just been a few years. 
Yes. Desegregation is only a few years old. The 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 ending of housing covenants and 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 red line contracts and and all the stuff that kept us living in certain neighborhoods, all of that stuff is still very very recent. Yes. Um, so when it comes to us even seeing the problem, like we've been told a. a We've been we've been told a really nice sunny story where one day Martin Luther King stood up for injustice and it was all better. Let's see free at last, free at last. It's like we don't actually talk about him being a young man who was in his 30s getting shot dead in the street. We don't talk about all his all of his contemporaries also being shot in the street before they made it to their 40s yes. and how these were directly including, you know, by the admission of our government, these were faults of our government in failing to do the bare minimum to keep these people alive. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place today, but I, I, I feel so strongly that we have a great awakening to do and just how we understand our own stories, how we understand our own experiences. So, yes. Yeah. yes, and that was actually my next question. Um, how can we improve to continue to fight uh, for, any, uh, for equality? And um, Tamara, I'll ask you that question um, because Darren just really kind of <laughs> touched it. Um, but I mean, we all still understand that it's, we're still in a fight. So I, I don't want us to construe that, get that twisted and, and, and act like uh, we're not um, in a fight. Um, we definitely are. So what, what is your opinion about that? Well, my opinion about how we can improve um, improve is just through knowledge. I think knowledge itself alone and not, um, as Darren said, um, not realizing what our experiences was and what our past consists of and how we've gotten there, how we got here from there. Um, don't that we can't continue to buy band-aid that. We can't continue to um, be okay with how the system is. Um, and I think that what happens is as, as we continue to evolve, we forget. You know, we forget, especially with the generation of, again, like this, like this social media platform, it makes us feel as if we're looking at this 1% of people and we're, you know, we're okay with some of the flashy things and some of the small things that we can, we can do and get that we, we band-aid that just so we won't lose that. I think it's fear. It's fear that if we stand up, um, if we talk about it, we'll be just like those people, uh, just like the people who lost their lives or got stripped from certain things or got called uh, crazy when you speak up and start really speaking that knowledge, you know, and I think mm -hmm. knowledge is the power um, and understanding um, some of the, some of the, um, the history and yeah. some of the, the, the teachings and the, the under, and the, the education that we have, are we not getting in our mainstream education and mainstream um, places that we look for this knowledge. So I definitely think that that's one of the key. Yes, and that's why I said today is 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 hard to, you know, I'm I'm uh, 51, um, you know, and and you know, what I'm saying we don't have anyone on the panel today that's over 60. So as Darren stated, we're still though we're not far removed. That, that's the issue and problem that I have is that we're not far removed from these things. And these things still exist. And we're going to, you know, talk about these things because, I mean, we want to call them out and just make note that if someone else is looking at this outside, we want them to know that, like, this is what you can see and put your finger on. Because sometimes people think that it doesn't exist because maybe they don't experience it or they don't see it specifically in their lives, maybe in their family, what church group, whatever it might be. But the thing is, is that we cannot continue to think that uh, being ignorant or being or not being seen or dealing with something is, you know, it doesn't affect us when it always affects, has always affected us more than any other race, that's the, that's the part that, you know, kind of gets me. It's like, you really think you've arrived, you know, we're not trying to down anyone, but like Antoine was saying that when we have this division in families, because you live in the suburbs and I still live in the city, we still haven't, we still don't get it. <laughs> we still don't get it when we have that kind of division over something simple and where you live. 
and don't look at the big picture of the fact that Chicago in its own way is still segregated in 2022. If you want to be real about it. Okay. So it's, that's the it's part. not in the own way it is segregated. Let's be honest now. Yes. All the way segregated. <laughs> yes. Yes. And and then and the next um question that I'm kind of rolling around is, you know, what role do you personally take in the fight? And um I'm gonna start with Angela on that. What role do you do you try to uh continue to impact and and really see and and live? Um, and understanding that we still we're still in the fight. Well, I try to live in my truth. I try to be real as possible. Um, my girlfriend preached today a sermon about blackish, about the ish, mm. living your black and not the ish. You know, um, I tr it's it's just hard, and I teach my my granddaughters and all and everybody to stand up for justice, stand up for what's right. Uh, not just because somebody else says is right. You got to know for yourself what is right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, seek out truth. Uh, if you think you're being mistreated, then speak on it. Uh, uh, even within your own race, you know, we have inequalities within our own race. You know, we, we yeah. that's, that's a different topic, but we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, to speak up on it, uh, especially uh, at the workplace, uh, in schools. Uh, when I was, um, I went to college at a, an adult, adult, a seasoned adult age. And uh, there was tons of inequality going on that I saw. And I saw at, uh, my first college experience was at, is it okay to name names? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was at Kennedy King and Kennedy King uh, service predominantly the African-American community. I don't know what the stats is, but I do know from the body of the students there, a lot of them look like me, majority, 99% of them look like me. <laughs> yeah. And for that, for me to say that is, Scholarships, a lot of times we wouldn't find out about scholarships. It took um, a Caucasian young man that I was in class with to tell me something about a scholarship. I say, scholarship for what? Scholarship, you know what? Tell me about it. He told me about it. And ever since then, I, I qualified for it. It's not like I did qualify for it. Uh, did nobody from the student body or whomever saw my grades and said anything to me about it either. It took somebody of the other race to say something about it. And I said that to say that uh, in all instances, inequality is taking a shift. Uh, I find that um, more people, uh, I used to drive Uber and Lyft and they used to tell me all the time here in Chicago, say, you guys are not racist. You, are, you guys are really, really down to earth. You love, you're, you love the different races here. You are very cultured. You, you have a multitude of cultures here. You're a melting pot. We don't have this, they will say, like in New York and other states, how it was so diverse. And it's good. I, I felt good to hear that I was living in a state where it was uh, taking a shift. Now, we're not 100%. But I would say that I have seen a lot of improvements in my lifetime. Yes, yes, and and, and we still need to improve. That's that's part of that's part of the fight. We still, I mean, it's yeah. it, it's it's, it's about, the work to be done. When it's we're work. talking, yes, when we're talking about it then and now, is 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 then and it's it's just now. And and I think the now has taken on a different face. But it's the same, right. um, you know, same animal, you know. So um, let me say, let me say this last mm -hmm. statement, uh, right quick, Delicia. I think okay. Amber has said something about um, about us being scared, mm -hmm. and I think that was her. Uh, but I do believe that a lot of people are scared and don't want to take voice on it. They feel as though if they take voice on it, then they may be shunned in whatever aspect of that of what that means of them taking a voice on so yeah but the thing that they don't understand is that if no one ever took a voice on it we wouldn't even be this far <laughs> that that's that's the 
that's the 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 uh, nail in the coffin. We would not be this far. You know, we're saying we're still fighting. Yes, we are, but we're not fighting in the capacity of civil rights. <laughs> you know, we're not. You know, dogs and stuff are not being sicked on us and beaten in the head. You know, and stuff like that. Not literally. I'll put it like that as well. Yeah. Not literally, but we can't yeah. see it. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not happening either. <laughs> um, so, um, Darren, what are some similar similarities between the civil rights movement um, and Black Lives Matter movement that you see uh, is happening right now today? Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the things that, you know, as we talked before about these histories that get kind of whitewashed and covered in a little glitter and you know rosy glasses is that we 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 sometimes think that the civil rights movement that everyone liked it we think hmm. that everyone was supportive of it all the black people were on board we think that um that there was like individuals who just stood up like Martin Luther King started the civil rights movement is not an accurate statement <laughs> and so we we in doing this kind of, you know, glancing over over this history, we miss how much even people like Dr. King were considered to be terrorists by our United States government. Sounds a lot like how they talk about Black Lives Matter, that um, people say you're asking for too much, your demands aren't clear, you're um, trying to make change happen too fast, um, and that there were people who were planted in the civil rights movement to cause disruption. There are people who were, who were paid by, again, the federal government to, to report back information and to sow discord and so forth. Um, and you know, to, to flip it to the other side, uh, here we are today with Black Lives Matter or any of the many, many movements that exist today um, that, that sprung up out of the need, like grassroots community organizing has been happening long before Black Lives Matter. And you know whether or not you love the organization that is Black Lives Matter, the movement of people rallying around care for Black lives is still going on. It's the same drum beat that's been happening, but because it's not newsy, it's not a headline article when mothers show up on blocks on the south side of Chicago to prevent uh, violence. And they consistently do so for years and years and years. No one's covering that for years. <laughs> or when uh, people like uh, Father Michael Flager and the St. Sabina community have been marching through their neighborhoods for years mm -hmm. and having direct impact. I was a part of groups that were in the same area where we were making all kinds of profound change. And it most of that didn't get covered. Most of that doesn't get heard about. But what we do um, is we have these features of what's wrong or what went, or we, you know, misconstrue things. It's like one of the Black Lives uh, Matter founders bought a million dollar home in California without giving credence to the fact that one, that person's a published author <laughs> and an educator and a speaker and has other means of income. It's not donations going to buy somebody a home. And also in context, a home, a million dollar home in California is a bungalow in Chicago. Thank like, you. It's not, it's, that doesn't mean that you've like made it big, but again, we like headlines, not actual information. We like sound bites, not actually understanding the stories. And so for me, I love being a part of this modern continuation of the same work that's been going on, the civil rights movement, the black power movement, all kinds of things that have been overtly fought by governments and people in power and people with money and even by fought by black people. Um, but that yet and still, as we've done forever, we've been indomitable. We've been able to rise up, continue to fight, continue to organize, continue to take care of each other. Because more than anything, Things like the Black Panther movement, they created our, our uh, lunch program and breakfast programs in schools. You know, this, this idea of universal health care and stuff, they were fighting for that a long time ago and making it real in Black neighborhoods where people couldn't get access to the things that they needed. And so 
I felt like I grew up grew up learning that the civil rights movement were the good guys and the Black Panthers are the bad guys. And today you might have kids growing up hearing that Black Lives Matter is the bad guys. And I don't know who they call the good guys. I don't know, a Trump rally or something. But <laughs> <laughs> Black people for Trump, you know, I don't know, but you'll, you'll see people try to make these out of context, historically inaccurate statements. And we, you know, it'll sound, it'll sound real logical. Somebody just sent me a video that was Morgan Freeman saying, why do we have Black History Month? And if you like listen to it, it's like, well, if I don't talk about, if I don't call you, a, he was inter being interviewed by a white reporter on 60 Minutes. If I don't call you a white man and you don't call me a black man, then we can end racism. Yeah, I can see how you get to that logic. But we know that that has never been how it worked. It wasn't how race was created. And it's not how race goes away or, or how the effects of race are diminished. And so it's just like, yes, we've got to, we have to continue to learn um, and understand exactly what moment we're in so that we can, you know, as you said before, find our role in, the ju in this march toward justice and, and um, equity that leads to equality. Um, but yeah, we just got to get our story straight. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank yes. you. And, and, Mor and Morgan Freeman is, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, um, he, he's thought that way for a long time, uh, born and raised in Mississippi, and still, even in, in, with his accolades, he lives in Mississippi um, today, um, and it's, I, sometimes I find it baffling, um, his association and just ideas of, of things like that, because he's, he's always spoken that way, and um, I don't know if it's going to change, um, but, but that's, kind of uh, someone's perspective, you know, just one person's perspective. So, but, you know, then we do, you know, have people that do think and feel that way. But Antoine, in your experiences, uh, do you see that if there are any differences between civil rights and Black Lives Matter? Do you feel there is a difference or do you think it's pretty much apples to apples? I pretty much see it as apples to apples because even though Thank God I wasn't born during the civil rights movement. And I kind of wish I wasn't born during the Black Lives Matter movement, but I see there's no difference because there are some people in the Black Lives Matter that's not for the movement. There are people that was in the civil rights movement that was not for them. Black people, I'm not gonna say whitewashed, but brainwashed, saying that's wrong, that's wrong. Like during the protests here in Chicago, on Michigan Avenue, Black Lives Matter was rioting and looting. Like, no, that wasn't Black Lives Matter. There was people that wasn't even in the neighborhood that came out of nowhere, put on masks, and started tearing up stuff downtown. Hey, Antoine, how you know? I live down the street from Michigan Avenue. I can see from my window. Come on now. I see for myself. I'm one of those people that actually read into the whole thing, but I see no difference. Now, I put both movements, don't get me wrong. But I see no difference. Yeah, and I and, and when I ask that question, that question is really to basically again define then and now. It's like again we're fighting the same fight, but it has a different face and a different name. But it's the same foundational racial inequality and disparities, you know. And um, Tamara, do you support the Black Lives Matter movement? Why or why not? I definitely support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, just like Darren and Antoine said, it's just a continuation of something that we've already acknowledged in a sense, but I'm just trying to continue to uh, gain and keep that power too. Um, I definitely support the Black Lives Matter movement. It's very important that we continue to make awareness around the inequality and what um, our young people are experiencing, our black men are experiencing, our black women are experiencing, our elderly are experiencing. Um, it's times where we just don't see these things. And now that, again, I keep bringing up social media, but that's a huge part because then we're able to connect to everyone around the world and say, hey, this is what happened. Put a video out and say, look at what happened. We would have never known what happened um, with Trayvon and all of these other, you know, putting a neck, putting a, the knee 
on his neck. You know, we would have never known these, these people's uh, experience if it wasn't for recording. You know, so it and then it takes people, the people that are not afraid to step up. And it, again, like I like like this important that people are afraid. They they work in their in their jobs and they think if they're they're a part of this group, they may be um, uh, experiencing some type of inequality themselves, or maybe attacking as or, or attack if they speak up. So they work in these corporate jobs, or maybe in educational fields, or maybe in some type of place where they want to play a safe for their family. And in them, they don't look at the broader picture, you know. So, of course, I definitely support Black Lives Matter. It's really important. Too. Yes, yes. And Miss Angela, I I want to ask you um, what it's hard to say, but to ask this question because the answer is so huge. We we had to ask it though. What what are one or two of the things, possibly, if you can even define them or think of them? will cause the division in our community when it comes to unifying in the fight against racial inequality and disparities? Do you think it's just that we are afraid? Do you think it's just we don't want to get involved? Do you think it's, we think, I mean, there's so many answers that could, you know, that could be out mm -hmm. there, but what are a few of the things you think? Wow. Um, I think, uh, so are we talk, we're talking, we're still referring to inequality, right? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Um, so I think it's break, broken up on in rage in ages of age categories as well. Uh, I feel as though maybe the older age group uh, probably relived a lot of the King and the Malcolm X's. And, all of that marches that went on, we did, and all the violence that went on in that time that they're like, want to leave it alone, so to speak. And uh, I don't think this younger generation, I just don't think we got enough fight in us. You know what I'm saying? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. But uh, we need to have more of a fight. I don't. I, it's just really hard to say because I can say a whole lot of things. Not to say is that you know what I mean. Yes. But if one thing is for sure is it's not happening. Um, I would love to see the churches take a, a more of a stand as well, um, because. Um, we're all supposedly Christians, so I would love to see them take take a stand and stay on it. Uh, not take a not do a march and then you be done. Oh well, I, I committed to to one march. No, we need to be. I, I'm a father of Fager fan, fan, and um, he's a man of a different race and a and of a different faith than me. But he has the compassion for the people. Period. And I love it. And I jump on his bandwagon at any given moment because he has what we all need, the gumption, the fight to, to, to rally to against for, for the greater good of everybody, everybody who's been unjustly done wrong. He's a fight for it, a fight, a fight to the end. And I think we need to support him more in his missions. And so if somebody else don't have... Let's say, for instance, um, he's doing a, a march and he wants people to march with him. I feel as though then the churches need to come together and support him and participate in that march or participate in whatever his um, candlelights be or whatever his uh, basketball events be, you know, to support, to build up, to draw more people in to the greater cause. But let me say this and then I'm going to shut up. Okay. A lot of times people don't do because, and they don't want to jump on with somebody else is because they don't want to share the limelight. They want it all for themselves. Yeah. And, but they're not doing it themselves. They're not stepping out doing it. So, yeah. So we as, we as black people need to come together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We say black lives matters, but we need to come together and, and really support Black Lives Matters to the mm -hmm. utmost. Exactly. Darren? Yeah, and I, and I, I just want to kind of expand the, the view because I, 
I think we all have like our individual experiences and it can feel certain ways. I know for me, um, I often grew up with the idea that black folks don't turn out to vote. And we've heard that, we've seen headlines, people have done interviews and talk, talk about well, why, why aren't black people turn, showing up to vote? But we don't also put that in, again, into context with what's happening in the larger society. For one, our voting isn't like exceptionally worse than other racial groups, um, especially for youth, mm -hmm. but we do have higher incidences of things like purging of the voting rolls, changing the location of the location hours and availability of places to vote. Um, there, are parts, there are parts of this country where you can only register to vote on certain days of the week, certain months out of the year. Like there's a whole process that you have to know, be able to access, have the right identification for all these things that were created and it's been proven over and over in court that were created to give um, to give conservatives, to give Republicans, to give groups that have been not supportive of Black folks, to give them an advantage when it comes to voting. And so, like you know, a few years ago, everybody's like, "Well, everybody can line up and, and go get Popeye's chicken, but they can't register to vote." <laughs> and the reality is, like Black youth went out and registered folks to vote even before they were old enough to vote. Yes. You know, but again, that's not the that's not the sizzling headline because everybody's talking about chicken and we like to talk about black folks and chicken. <laughs> we don't even talk about that chicken wasn't considered quality meat and that's why black folks and chicken is a thing. But because it's what we could get, we made it the thing that everybody wants. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that piece. But I also think about um, when we talk about uh, collective action, we don't all have the same role in a parade. We don't have all the same role in a march. We don't have all the same role in the fight for justice. And so like I was just today, and I'm gonna just name drop them real quick. Just today, I was learning about, oh, uh, here it is. I was learning about um, a gentleman by the name of Norris B. Henderson. Mm. And most of us probably don't know that name, but Morris B. Henderson was one of the first uh, black millionaires in the in the U.S. Not only by any means, but he was one of the first. But he was specifically known for um, supporting, funding, ensuring the civil rights movement. Made huge donations to Dr. King and many others. Um, but he was also a gay black man. When again, in a time where that was a liability, that was a problem, and so realizing that him being a businessman and being able to write the checks to support things like the buses that get people to the marches, him being able to write the checks that support people getting out of jail when they've been, um, when they've been jailed for, for completely made up charges, him being able to do that kind of support doesn't mean he has to be at the front of a line. For all of us, we, I, I always say we all have a role in the fight for justice and our roles are not the same. Cause just like, you know, if you, if you have a Christian perspective we are one body with many different parts in the fight for justice, we all have different things to do. Some of us will be teachers. Some of us will be the funders. Some of us will be the home who keep the people who stay home and keep the kids all right <laughs> yes. while everybody else is out in the streets. We all have something to do, but for us to look around to figure out what's my strength, what's my ability and then to do that. So you might not be able to, to march for hours on the street, but you can stand, you can sit on the corner with a nice chair and a little umbrella and get people registered to vote. And that's still a part of the fight. Yes, yes. And the word, I mean, the, the word division in our community, um, like I said, it is just so broad that I don't think we'll ever be able to really fully um, understand um, understand that. And also, um, just piggybacking on everything you and Angela said, Father Flega has paid the price. Mm -hmm. How many people will, are willing to pay the price? Um, he was seat, uh, unseated for about six to eight months um, due to a, a sexual uh, case that came against him um, 40 years later. Um, his, his, his son has, his, his, uh, one of his two adopted sons were killed by gun violence, by a drive through So like, like Tamara said, there is a lot of things that we fear as Black people. And sometimes when we think we've attained certain things or a certain 
uh, uh, economic, you know, money or whatever the case may be, it's like in our minds, we don't want to lose that because it might have, it most likely it took us <laughs> hell of high water to get that. So in there, in your right mind, if you were asking a regular person, a regular black person, I'm putting it like that. If you were asking a regular black person, are you willing to give up? your $100,000 job to speak up for your race? That's a big question. And so we like you, uh, you know, we have to have empathy and sympathy for the division, but it's all, like you said, it's always been there, it's always been planted or it's always been in someone's mind. I just recently saw uh, a report on PBS on Channel 11 about Ida B. Wells how she was supposed to be one of the founding founders of NAACP, but W.E. Du Bois himself mm -hmm. <laughs> refused to make her a part of the board or acknowledge her as part of the board for two reasons. One, she was a woman because that was the time. Two, because she was talking about lynching in the South. He didn't want to touch that. So he was like, well, just she could sit over there. She could be a part of us, but we're not going to acknowledge it. And I was baffled because, of course, that would bring division because now she doesn't have support in people who she thought she would have support in. A brilliant mind, he's called, in our community, a brilliant mind. W.E. Du Bois, this, 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 that. But yet he will snuff out the voice of someone like her. Yeah. Due to those two reasons. Right. Like, so many times that those conflicts were happening. W. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. MLK, like all these folks was like, I don't agree on how you want to see justice. Yes. And like you said earlier, we we have not had full support by Black people for either right, civil rights or Black Lives Matter. You know what I'm saying? If you ask the average person, a lot of people on Black Lives Matter are being prosecuted, mm -hmm. are being sent to jail, or they bank records being looked into. It's the same, like I said, same foundational, <laughs> but a different name. Civil rights versus Black lives. Then and now. Yes, Antoine. Yes, and we have to look at it like this. It started way before even slavery, because if you look at the continent of Africa, well, actually, we was in Europe, too, and all over the place, but uh, we was divided in the continent of Africa. We was fighting against each other then, and we kept that saying, I'm big, I'm bad, even though we was all the same change. We I was, will push back on that, though. <laughs> wait, what, what, what'd you say? I would push, push back on that history that, that we were divided in Africa, because like the the african continental map we didn't make that we we lived on the land together right right and i know that colonizers right. divided <laughs> yeah I'm, i was just seeing like there are times that we was the war what have you but colonizers took advantage of that and used a little disagreements we had and sold us for nothing or took over we thought we was getting something good in return, but got messed up. And that's the deal right here. Until this day, we think we're getting something big now. But I'm sorry, a thousand dollars, you can't even get an apartment for a thousand dollars unless you got low income. Yeah, but it's, it's rough in these streets. And it these, is. Uh, stimulus checks check are not the end all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, I mean, Padero is definitely gonna have to edit this because that is that is oh my god, that's a whole different animal. He caged up, and Lord Jesus, if we let him out, he would tell he go he done tore a lot of people up. Okay, <laughs> the stimulus. Oh goodness, but we're we we oh my god. We're gonna try to move. I'm gonna move on because That's I all right. so much. I'm about to dive in, and I'm like, I'm not gonna let Darren <laughs> get me all get <laughs> Oh my goodness! But the next one, oh my god, oh my god, police brutality. And I, I wanted to try to hit this before Darren has to get off. 
<sighs> is there a difference between police corruption and police brutality then and now? So again, I'm asking, is, <laughs> is there a difference between corruption and brutality then and now? Does it still have the same foundation, but a different face? And um, I'm gonna hit Darren first because you're gonna have to leave and then I'm gonna hit Tam next on that question. Yeah. Um, so my, my, my quick-ish answer of that is um, the system, I would say that the system of policing in the United States has always and forever been about the subjugation of poor people, especially those who are black, for the purposes of supporting the wealthy class. And so from that perspective, us creating the slave patrols and slave catchers that eventually became the formal organized policing system in the US for us to do things like the creation of the federal incarceration system and the local versions of that, all of those have direct ties to things like the 13th Amendment, which was a transfer of the function of slavery from private ownership to debt to the state. Like it literally says, you can't keep slaves unless they've been duly committed, duly convicted of a crime. And historically, we saw all kinds of crimes get created, like the pig laws, these things that were just, oh, you're, you're loitering. Now you need to serve hard time, which means you do free labor for private companies to profit from. Oh, imagine that. Or like today, where there are people who are serving, serving um, multiple decades in jail because they stole a $200 coat. It costs over $20,000 a year to house people in jail and in incarceration. Um, so policing, incarceration, the correction system, I would say all of those are the same one unending chain of abuse toward poor people, especially those who are Black. So that's my short answer. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam, um, piggybacking off of that, do you feel that African Americans will always have to endure unfair treatment by the police? Do you think we'll ever get from under, treat, you know, treated fairly by the police? Um, Darren, he said that so well. I was saying he wrapped that up just so well. It was like it was wonderful. That that was that was awesome. How you say that? Um, do I think so? Because I have a very good pure heart. I will very much hope so. Um, I have faith and hope that it will, because we could we continue to evolve in in a good way. It's not as if it's getting worse. I'm not going to say it's it's is is definitely still on the same same track. We have we still deal with some some of the same things um, in a different hidden way, just like Darren said. It may not be a complete brutality, but it's still a hit on our credit, stopping us from doing certain things. It's still the way that they won't pay us the right amount of money to get us out of the spaces that we're in. It's still those things that are um, still brutal brutal to us, you know. Without putting your hands on us you can do things that still hurt us in a lot of ways. Um, so I would definitely say that um, I really truly hope that one day that this will end, you know, and then we will have the same equal rights and opportunities, opportunities and we won't have to deal with uh, the brutality or the corruption within the organization. But I think it goes a little bit deep with the corruption because it's just, just as uh, Antoine said, it, it started so long ago. The corruption, it's been a long way through. And here we go, and we can speak about biblical with that, you know, because it's all the politics and, and the church and all that, it kind of plays in, in a role in our history of corruption and things as such. You know, it's a lot of things to play on corruption. Um, but I would definitely, I definitely think that we are special people. I definitely think that we are a, a, uh, we are a blessed people. And I really think that one day, yes, 
Yes, we will overcome. We shall. <laughs> we shall. Yes. 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 I must agree. Now, Angie, do you support the defunding of the police? Would that be an option that you would even uh, visit or think about? Uh, no, I don't support that, to be honest with you. Uh, I actually like the police. I actually, if something happens to me, who am I going to call? 911. <laughs> I mean, uh, besides God being the first and the foremost, uh, 911 is the next, it's next in line, to be honest with you. Um, I call my daddy, he 80 something years old, he's going to come rushing over here with his gun and be found guilty and in jail at 80, 82 years old. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's not going to work. Um, I, I do. I haven't. Uh, I know. So all police are not bad police. All black people are not bad. Some are good. Some are bad. I mean, that's just how life goes. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend to defund them. I don't. Because how all is good. Um, in all actuality, we actually do need them. Uh, do the, can the system be um, uh, configured to to do 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 we need changes? Yes, we do. I think the system has flawed us in a lot of ways. Yes. Uh, are the police uh, because are the police the reason why it's been like that? No, the 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 people we have making laws and rules and everything they have filter those down to the police and the police in turn try some of them to <laughs> govern themselves by those rules and regulations. So there's flaws in everything, but I do still support the police. I do. Yes, yes. And Darren, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah. And I'd, I'd actually like to hear what other folks think before I respond, because you know, I always got a lot to say. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. like, who, who, so, who so Mr. Anton. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Yeah, going, going back to the question, defund the police. I do not support defund the police, but I will support is funding to get the police mental training in tech. Because I know some people personally that I know good as dog on well is not mentally stable to serve, to serve and protect. And they are very, very trigger happy. And one thing I learned for sure. If you go shoot at somebody, it's a certain parts of the body you shoot where they'll drop their vehicle, I mean, they are gone. But you don't have to do those 17 more shots and nothing like that. You don't have to shoot to kill. And that's not serving to protect, that's killing. Yeah. Yeah. It's enough thugs on the streets that's doing that ourselves. Yes. Not me, but uh, just in general. Yes, I understand. Yes, yes. yes. Tam, what, what, is your, what is your take on defunding? Um, I definitely think we need some regulatory and some some definitely some changes. Um, but I think the funding should should be going to a different area. Um, if that is the case, I'm not sure exactly how that. You know, I haven't went into the details of how it's set up. You know, I, ha I honestly I haven't. But I do know that there is definitely some new training and some um, new material. Something needs to be done within a police organization in order to structure it better. Um, uh, ethics are, are going to play a huge role, and you know I think think that they should look at how they train and develop, and who they who they put into the community to be the officers that uh, that oversees the different communities. I think that uh, we need to to be able to not not compare. What's the one I'm trying to say? Uh, be able to um, uh, I was on the tip of my tongue. It's not a simple word. We need to connect with our community that we're serving. Um, so I think that it matters who you put to serve and protect them. I think those spaces need to be changed. If anything, it's just the um, the connection within the community. We need to understand what you know. We need to have more 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 uh, leadership roles that that actually understand the the people that they're serving within the community. Not define them, but put the right funds into the right people to serve the community. Yes, yes, I agree with you. And I, I, I know you have a question, Antoine, but we sh we're going to be losing Darren shortly. Okay, so, okay, um, I just want him to get his his um, answer out um, about the defunding. Yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate the just the, the opportunity to hear how people hear the, the words defund the police. 
Um, because again, like we, 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 we grow up with certain things just being the norm, right? Um, but if we were to look for a moment, when's the last time you saw a fire truck driving around looking for a fire? Mm. We don't see that. Fire trucks respond to where there is a fire emergency or where there's a medical emergency because they have medically trained staff to show mm -hmm. up and respond to that. Police, however, will set up traps on sides of roads and they'll drive all around the city just patrolling endlessly and using gas, using, you know, people are on paid time to do that. And they do that until they find something. And usually it's not a safety issue that they're responding to. The vast majority of police calls and responses are to things like broken taillights and to things like parking in the wrong spot on the wrong side of the street on a different day. And so now you have to pay a hundred dollar ticket for that. And so most of the activity of policing as we know it currently is generating revenue so that they can keep on policing. The idea and the, the, the statement to serve and protect actually isn't legally true. The police do not have to protect you if they see you being harmed. The, the United States Supreme Court decided that police are not obligated to protect anyone. Mm. They're, they don't have that as a part of their job description. And so when we talk about this idea of defunding the police, what we're not saying is, let's go anarchy. That's, I think that's what they, you know, we hear on the news that, that, that that's what people are saying, but no. If you look at a place like Black Youth Project 100, that's been doing this work for years, under the title fund black futures then it's about funding where's the funding going and so what they're saying is for example in the city of chicago almost 50 percent of our annual budget for the entire city of chicago goes entirely into policing mm -hmm. and that's not unusual in large cities across this country and so again, when I talk about what is the activity of policing, it's generating revenue by having people go around and look for opportunities to, to find people. But it's not, if they, they can literally drive by me getting beat up on the side of the street and there's no legal obligation if they intervene. So when we talk about defunding, we're saying, stop putting 50% of the entire budget of the city of Chicago into having police drive around and write tickets and instead make 911 a place that you can call. And if someone's homeless, they're not going to jail, they're going to a shelter, they're going to somebody who can get them mental health services. If someone's having a mental health crisis, which is very common, especially for people who don't have access to healthcare, who don't have access to proper housing and so forth, someone who can show up and address the need. And if you do have a broken tail light, why don't we have someone who comes out and fixes your tail light? What if we, instead of spending all this money on miking fines, so now you not only have to fix your tail light, but you also have to pay a fine that doesn't get your tail light fixed. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you can keep getting a tail light ticket every hour on the hour. Yes. And if you have a police officer who doesn't like you, they can just they can just show up in your neighborhood just every day to write you that ticket and there's nobody to stop them and if that police officer is at home beating their their spouse which is actually more than 50 percent of police officers according to the research there's nobody who who do you call when you're when your spouse is the police who who shows up for that and so this idea of defunding the police this idea of abolishing the police i'm both i'm pro abolish and defund is not the idea that we just want anarchy and we don't need anything. It's the idea that there are other systems that have been proven in other cities, like uh, there's a really great example in Oregon, where if you actually put the money into the things that we need when we typically are calling the police, that crime goes down, people are safer, you don't need more guns. <laughs> I'm also very adamant that we need to do something about the guns in this country instead of handing out more guns to people who we say are trained and also they can point a gun in my face and I'm supposed to keep them calm because if I get shot it's because they were fearing for their lives even though I'm the person who I'm supposed to call them for help I'm just saying I think there's an imagination that we have yet to tap into 
that we have not always existed as humans with policing as an institution. We were doing a lot of other things long before this was created, again, originally to catch human beings who we thought should be enslaved to the state. And so I, I would love for us to continue to use our holy imagination to use all of this wisdom and power we have, not just jump on somebody's specific bandwagon. I don't think you have to jump on defund the police. I do think that we have the power to collectively imagine what could the world be like if people had the food that they need so that they didn't have to go hold up the liquor store? What could the world be like if they had the mental health access that they need so that they don't have to snap off and hurt somebody in the street? What could the world be like if the funding that we say we don't have enough money to do things? What if we stop spending it and sending it to Israel or spending it and sending it to, uh, to showing up for Ukraine and, and Russia. And I'm not saying those aren't important, mm -hmm. but I'm saying we have made choices about where money goes that at the end of the day, we can make ourselves safer and we can make our world better if we just imagined what we could do differently than what we keep sending our tax dollars and keep sending our, our money to and keep having people in, the, in jeopardy. Police officers are in danger every day, just like somebody said, because they don't know how to show up to a mental health call. And the only tool that they've been given on their belt is tools of violence. What if they had a weighted blanket <laughs> for somebody who's autistic and is having a meltdown and instead of you showing up thinking that you have to kill them because that's the only tool you have, you can call the person who knows how to deal with an autistic person who, um, again, statistically, the, the majority of people who are harmed in, in police shootings are people with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's over 50%. So yeah, I just wanna, I just wanna you know, as my little closing words to say, we can imagine Black futures. We can fund these futures. We can fund the possibility that there's something more than what we've already had. Yes, and I appreciate all of your input today, and I thank you so much um, for being here and giving all of your wisdom and understanding um, of things, because I think sometimes people are not well-versed, and um, they make judgment on certain things, and defunding the police, I really do feel that is one of those, um, those categories that I don't think we know enough about. I don't think we've done enough research about it. And we don't really even understand what it actually means to defund. I mean, you just think you, like you said, abolish it and just cut police out. Well, we know we cannot do that, but that is not the whole scope of defunding the police. And I pre again, I appreciate you being here today and, and spending time with us. Love to you. <laughs> so, Much love everybody. Yes. Yeah. So Antoine, you had something to say or has Darren kind of... <laughs> you know what? He touched on it, but I will say okay. this, though, um, okay. piggyback. One of the issues, not just with Chicago Police Department here in Chicago, but mm -hmm. all major cities with the police department, they have one of the strongest unions in this country. And they ruin unions so strong that they could literally allow to get away with murder. Because have you ever seen any cops that shoot somebody, self-defense, whatnot? You don't see no very, we just now start seeing trials, police being on trials, things like that. And you have seen that duty, paid leave. You vaguely see non-paid or police go to jail for three months or six months. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I'm glad to see that, but it's progress being made, but because these police departments have such strong unions that they can get away with everything and anything. Now that's something that should be addressed. A lot of me call them, contact the mom, um, alderman. That's something that we as a people need to start doing. Contacting our representatives on the city, state, county, and even federal level. That's what I, I had to say right now. Okay, I must, I must agree. I must agree because piggybacking on that about defunding um, the police, we're 
is, is still incorporated into the police brutality as far as drugs. You know, um, Tam, how has drugs and the war on drugs impacted your life personally and your immediate community and where you, you have lived and experienced? Because the thing is, is that we've had uh, President Nixon, we've had President Reagan, we've had President Bush, we've had President Clinton just in 1994 write a law into the thing that there was a difference between crack and cocaine. So we know that, you know, drugs have been infiltrated in our communities. You know, we've had our bouts with heroin. We, we've had our bouts with every kind of drug that's known to man. But yet, when a white person uh, comes in the city and buys uh, heroin or opioids, it, there's, a, there's 10 commercials on, on the screen but it doesn't talk about that uh, child, uh, those five children that lost their mother to drugs. Yes, I think that is a, a part of the corruption. Um, I do, I, I have, I'm, I, I believe in that conspiracy that the government is the reason why drugs hit the black community so hard. You know, even though they was arresting the um, black young men for selling it, they was actually providing it to them. I really believe in that conspiracy that that came from the government, came from um, higher authorities to infiltrate our community and to dumb us down, um, to take away from our families. Um, and that's an, an, another just war on us, you know, and that's a, another part of the whole structure of the system that is here to to um, take our, 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 our nation, our culture apart and it, and it is, you know, it, it started from there. So um, I think that a, a lot of black families uh, have experienced family and friends with addiction. Um, I think that every time we get over an, a stage of addiction, maybe it's crack cocaine or maybe it's heroin, it's something new, you know, for the new generation now, it's the opioids, it's the pills, you know, it's, so, so it's something always new to come into our communities and, and create this, this, it's a continuation. Every time we say, okay, y'all beat that. Uh, y'all, y'all got smart about that. Y'all got us on here, so let's get something else out here to dumb you down, or to you know to create this, you know this uh, this, this 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 structure in your community to, to fall apart. So um, that right there is a is going to be to be a continual fight of education. You know, um, addiction it runs in the blood. You know, so not only now, so now that you know we're having children from addiction, it's a blood. It's in the blood. So it's a huge fight. It's a fight not only within our communities, but it's a mental fight, it's a spiritual fight. That fight is 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 is, is broadened because the addiction is real, you know, and um, a lot of people take this these drugs opportunities to get away from, from their experiences. They want to get away from the reality of everything that's happening. So it it that fight now becomes you know more broader. So it's it's very hurtful. It, I've experienced it personally um in my life. When it came to uh, drugs, and it, it affected me um, in a huge way. But as I continue to understand it more and get a little bit more educated, I understand that it is a fight that you just have to endure. You have to fight for it. You have to fight for your family. You have to fight for your community. You have to get knowledge. You have to reach for help. You have to. Um, you. It, it really is. It, it really is a, a fight for in our community and in ourselves when it comes to addiction because it's not only. It, it can't. It's not only that. It does not only have to be the uh, the pills. It can be in the food. You know, it can be sugar. Mm -hmm. It can be caffeine. It can be cigarettes. Something that you can walk in the store and buy, but it's so addictive that it will take twenty years off your life. It'll cause all these different issues. So the addiction and the drugs. That story is so. Yes, yes, I, I agree with you 100%. There's nothing that I would say, oh, no, that's I don't think that's true. Oh, no, it's very much true. And Antoine, I want to give you the opportunity. And then Angela, I want to both give you the opportunity to just briefly um, just answer that question. How has it affect, how has the war on drugs and drugs affected your life and your community? Amster, do you want to go first, ladies first? Uh, wow, well, thank you. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, the war on drugs, um, I hate it. I hate it with a passion. Um, I just hate it because um, 
it's affected my family. Uh, it's affected, it has affected so much. Um, it, I, I just have found out people who you haven't thought of that it has, that is on drugs, is on drugs. And it just really dampens my heart. Mm -hmm. And it's a war on drugs, but it's a disease within our black community. Mm -hmm. I, and that, don't get me wrong, other communities are affected as well. But I'm just so saddened by my own community, how it has devastated us so badly. And uh, I think the war on drugs, uh, Tamara was on to something when she was saying that it was uh, connected on a higher level, and it is, and I believe that as well. Uh, but it's associated with the drug, with the gangs. Uh, all of this is together and it just has, uh, I believe it has also brought our communities down drastically from where it used to be. Some areas is picking back up and things, uh, the community seems to be getting a handle on it. But in other areas, it's, it's, going, it's getting worse. And I've seen that too, because I have moved, I have moved from an area where um, the the gang, uh, not the gangs, the drugs had just taken completely over. And then I shifted and moved to another area and I could see how the community is not having it. Yes, yes. And, I, and I'm living it and seeing it. So if I wouldn't have lived it and seen it, I would have never believed it. Right. But it really is, and, we're, and I'm not up north. I'm still in the in a, in a community that's governed by, it's a mixed community, but it's still, I think the African-American community is still strong presence over where I am. And uh, yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. I hate drugs. Yes. Uh, yeah. The ones that's damaging to our body, that's taking control of the mothers and fathers and the children of the world, you know? It's just yeah. sad. Yes. Okay, Mr. Antoine. Okay. It affected, thank God, I never did drugs. I don't even like taking drugs that doctors prescribe to me. I do if I have to, but it affected my communities. I was born and raised in North Lawndale area. It affected the community so much that I was told growing up, all 22 years I lived there, your daddy dead, you're gonna be right here. You're not gonna get no college degree. You're not gonna be nobody. You have to be right along with us. You go sell drugs yourself. Thank God that was the devil was a lie. Now, at the end, the Austin neighborhood where I moved to, they didn't come at me by seeing drugs take down people and also messed up their brains where they decided to join gangs and whatnot. That's why to this day, the North Lawndale and Austin on the news this day. North Lawndale, also on news this day. And it's not the fact that I moved from the areas because I thought it was better. The fact of the matter is, I cannot see my own people kill themselves, drug wise and bullet wise. Yeah. Now, on a family note, I have had family, a lot of them, not just alcohol, but drugs, die from it. Alcohol poison, liver failure, or whatnot. And even though I tried my best, never judging, but saying, you don't have to do this. I can help you or come with me to this place. But saying, oh, I'm good. To the point where I had to turn my back, not because I was, I had no faith in them, but the fact I could not see them kill themselves or that slowly. To the point where some people, friends, I just could not go to. And that's very understandable because even I would have to jump in to, to commenting on that. I mean, we've all experienced it. I honestly believe the percentage is so, you know, like anywhere from 95 to 99 percent um, in the Black community that we've experienced. And even touching on what a little bit of what Tamara said is the fact that we, you know, I've always heard growing up, we don't have boats, we don't have airplanes, we don't have, you know, things 
um, that, that a way to get the stuff in to, you know, our communities. Um, and it's been known that, you know, they, they've, that things have been flooded into our community specifically, mm -hmm. like I said, drugs. And so we've all been affected, but uh, as Tamara said too, I am very mindful because I have had addiction in my immediate family, mother and father, you know, and so I am very mindful of making sure that I, you know, that I have not given myself into having an addiction, you know, very mindful of, you know, I'll take a drink, but I'm, I know that I don't want to go surpass that because my DNA is going to be fighting me to go to go to the other side of that, you know, and everything. And so, I, you know, that's part of what we're going to uh, talk about next is so society driven genocide and self imposed genocide. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could talk all day on that because it's so heavy in our community right now. I, I can't even explain how heavy it is. Um, I'm going to start with Angie this time. What are some of the things that you have seen or possibly even experienced that you believe is still driving genocide in the Black community? Whether it be society driven, like we said, by you know politics or something, um, you know, trying to keep us down, but the self-imposed is really the 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 mass that's at a, at a different name. Then then we could see it more in segregation. It, it had a face and it had a name, but the self-imposed we didn't see that with civil rights, but yet we see that now. Do back again back to going back to drugs and. Well, um, it goes back to my statement I said before, um, the self the self genocide of the gangs. The gangs are filtering out these drugs. And in turn, we are self-inflicting ourselves uh, with these drugs. And I think it's on another level too, because uh, some of it, I believe, is the mental illness of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the funding and of mental institution has been cut. We have more mental people with more mental illness out here that's homeless, that's uh, it, mental illness, homeless, and they're all uh, in turn drug, drug addict, addicted. And it's a cycle. Some of them are not mentally ill, but a, a big portion of them is. Um, how do I know? Because I go out and I try to help service them. And it's just, wow. And I, it seems to be, like I said, a never ending cycle. It keeps going, it keeps going, and it keeps going. Some kind of way we have to get a hand. Um, all it takes is for one teenager to, uh, Somebody say, here, try this. And next thing you know, they're hooked and they want more of it or they like it. Or uh, some, some team to say, oh, uh, I wanna make some easy money, go out here and selling it, selling it. And next thing you know, you, you like New Jack City, you using it, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's a cycle out here. And I know it can be broken, but what? And how? Yes, that's the that's the optimum optimal question um, because I honestly, <laughs> in my own opinion, besides prayer, I man, it's it's that's you know, it, it's it's like you said, it's it's a lot to just deal with. But when I was going over these questions and creating these questions, you know, civil rights, you know, society was doing that to us, you know, lynching us and doing all the, you know, putting back an enslavement, but this self-imposed genocide? We're doing it, yes. you're right. We're doing it to ourselves. Yes. And the sad thing is about it is, Alicia, we don't even understand it. Um, we don't. My brother and I are very close and he's addicted to whatever. And he's been like that for over, uh, for over 40 years, well over 40 years. And, uh, we have a very good relationship and he'll tell me uh, 
Sis, I need to leave these drugs alone. I was, I, I guess I had the other day, I, I, I was on a bus and I don't know what it is I, it was, that was in it, but um, I found myself at the end of the line and I didn't have my phone, but he wound up at home. He didn't realize that he didn't have his phone. I'm surprised he found out well, how to get home, but he did, but he didn't know where his phone was. Come to find out the people had his phone at the bus station and they, and some kind of way he found out and he went riding all the way to the, to the bus station to get it. So the, my, what I'm trying to get at is that he's like, they're not even put, they're putting stuff in to the drugs to take you to even more of another level. They're killing you inside the drug itself. Yes. He said, this is not some regular drugs out here. I said, well, you have to leave it alone. Yeah. He said, I know I do, sis. I just got to. He said, I said, because you're slowly killing yourself. And he's like, I know that. I know that. Yeah. I know that. A lot, of, a lot of times they know that, but but stopping is 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 the optimal um, thing that that a lot of us are are not when we're addicted to anything. A lot of times we're not equipped to stop, even though we know it's killing us, you know. And Tam, because you have younger children, I really wanted to ask you this question because. Right now, I don't feel like I'm really well versed on the self-imposed genocide, but I do know that when I every night I turn on the news, some child is being shot, um, you know, by innocent, you know, thing that's going on in the streets. You know, everyone says it's drugs, but is it really drugs or the mentality of what is being, you know, created out there? I, I'm, I'm trying to understand maybe you could have a different perspective or, or really help me to understand and people like me who are gonna be listening to this, who have young kids who understand the language that's out there and could possibly have an answer or not even an answer, but to maybe explain why the kids say this is the reality that they're living in. I think it's, I definitely think it's both. Um, I think it's both um, the reality, they want to escape the reality that they're living in. Ultimately, it's because of the confusion of what is the purpose of life. You know, I think that 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 is a huge question to humanity. Like, why are we here? What is the purpose of life? What are we doing? What are we to do? You know, if you turn on the TV and the radio and the social media, what they're looking at is to chase money. You know, it's to um uh, deal with relationships in a certain way and chase money and when they when they 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 don't see their self embedded in that dream sometimes it can be challenging just to escape it you know and then if they and then of course it's cool to be high it's cool to indulge in drugs it's cool to be this certain way because of um uh the fake reality um and then what happens is then all these other things plays a part which is um, addiction, which is peer pressure, which is relationships, listening to other people, not understanding self. And I think it starts with the understanding of self and, and you have to grasp spirituality, you know, and a lot of times the children are not in a real solid household that has that foundation. So then now we, we have uh, other households and other things raising our kids' mentality. And in that, in that case, then you, you do you do have a lot of self-infliction because of what you perceive life should be or is um, based off of the picture that is painted, but it's a fake reality. It's, it's a true fake reality because um, again, knowledge is power, wisdom is power. When you begin to understand where you came from, you begin to understand who you are. A lot of us don't understand that we were kings and queens, that we had a, a, a culture, we had strength, we had spirituality on our side from, from, from birth, from, from the whole entire time of, of creation. You know, and then when we lose that aspect of life, we, we truly disconnect from life. And that disconnection, a lot of people, a lot of times I, I tell you, you tell my children, you think that um, what you experience in a physical matter is the most important thing. And it's not, you are a soul. There's nothing that your body can do without your soul. Once your soul is gone, your body becomes nothing. So definitely take care of your temple, but understand also that there's another reality that you can't see. And that is that other little, that little, that, that little, um, uh, talk that little other conscious. 
when your other conscience comes and say, I know I shouldn't do this, but then you see it and say, I'm going to do it anyway. I know it doesn't seem right, but you smell it. And it's just that, con you know, it's, it's that fight. It's that battle. And, and we, as uh, we, our children, sometimes our children don't understand that other side to their life. And it's that metaphysical side, that spiritual side. They don't understand that side. And that's where the mental instability comes in. Because if you're not understanding what's going on in your head and your heart, then it's a catastrophe. Mm. Then you have all these mental problems. You know, you can't get why. And is is, is that it, so it, it wraps around a little bit more furtherly than just this particular topic. It comes mm. into play so many other uh, realms and so many other things that really need that we can we need to tackle in order to really fight that and really understand what's really going on in the world. Okay. And as far as the gang and the killings and all the drive-bys, is, is there language that they use why they're doing that? Does anyone ever say, well, yeah, I, I, you know, was it jealousy for Instagram? Was it jealousy because someone seemed to have more or may, I mean, is it really gang driven and, the, you know, with the, with the war and them fighting about the drugs and making the money or is yeah. it something else? It's clout. It's definitely clout. It is. It's about the money. It's about the power. It's about the drugs. It's about the clout. Who you are, what state you're from, if you're from the north, if you're from the south. It's a, it's about it's about that. Yes, it is. It's, it's, but but again, that's the fake reality. It's just a fake reality for to divide and conquer us on a on an inside. You know, just to just to take us away from who we really are and knowing and really we're cousins. You really look yes. down my bloodline. You didn't kill your cousin. You didn't kill your uncle, sister, nephew because we look alike. We are alike. The same last name. Married into people, and we just don't know each other. I didn't even know that you was my cousin, and I killed you. But going our bloodline, you was my sister, cousin, brother, sister, nephew from back. You know, and yes. it's like because we don't know we're lost. Yes, yes, yeah, and 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 that's one of the questions. Is like how what roles can we play to? individual individually and collectively get a handle on this I, like I said I I don't understand the language I, I would like to understand the language of what you know capacity that is but I think that that's a disservice too of me not knowing why that ha that's happening in our community the self-genocide and and me I care but what what more can I do? What more can, um, in your opinion, Antoine, what more would you be able to do uh, individually and collectively to maybe have language or talk or understand how we can wrap our heads around this? Me personally, not just myself, but all of us in a positive aspect, try to open our be open to learning why people are doing this. It's I know it's very hard to understand because thank God I never joined the game, did not do drugs. The closest I got to was weed, but uh, and I even had a limit with that. But I stopped that immediately when I learned that my heart was being affected. But just being open and be willing to talk. People tell you right now, like, if I see you sell drugs, like, you don't have to do that because you're really not making no money. Yeah. Any change you make, it's not going to your, will stay in your pockets too long. Yes. So true. So true. If, if you only knew the background of when drugs is put in the community, you wouldn't even do that. Or even in gangs, if you only knew, why you fight over territory that's not yours? This is the city of Chicago. Or well, this is this township territory. This is just, you don't own this. You live in somebody else's apartment. You don't own no territory over here. So don't fight over it. It's no point in fighting. Mm -hmm. As she said, we brothers, we cousins. Like I have a common last name, Johnson. All the Johnsons fight, guess what? Y'all could be related by blood. You don't even know it. Mm -hmm. It's not that serious. I'll be open to talk. Now, I'm not going to go out there while they shooting and say, no, nah, no, nah, don't shoot. I'm not going to do that now. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I'll be willing to talk to them. And from a distance, I'm willing to talk to police officers. Mm. 
it's a reason why I say from a distance because they more trigger hungry than gangs are. I'll say just we as a whole just be more open to talk and understand each other. Yes. And not talk, not talk to be heard, but listen to learn. Thank you for that. And Miss Angela, since you have grandbabies, I mean, what is your take on your experience with them and, and understanding, you know, the the, the self-imposed genocide? I mean, what are what are their thoughts and, and, and what are your thoughts in helping them even navigate and understand about that? Do you have the language as, as a grandmother to really understand it? They call me all the time and I say, baby, we have to pray. At a young age, I taught them how to pray. We have to pray. I don't, I don't have the answers and it's sad. I don't. And mm. I just continually tell them to pray. Uh, we talk about life. We talk about drugs. We talk about sex. We talk about everything. We talk about any and everything. And you have to be well informed and keep your, your children well informed of what's going on. Uh, of what's going on out here. Uh, I have that one granddaughter in college and I say, well, I know you're going to be going out, hanging out. I say, if you happen to be drinking something, don't leave your drink alone, uh, unattended. And she's like, Nana, you don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to drink. I said, but in the event you do want to try something, take it with you or finish it before you get up. Yeah. Don't leave it for somebody to say they're watching it for you. Don't yeah. trust no one to that magnitude. Yes. And, you know, I just come real with them. But in all honesty, I don't have the answers. Mm, okay. okay. I just keep it real. Just And I just, more than anything, I pray. We pray all the time. I pray. They'll, they'll text me, uh, Nana this or Nana, Nana, Nana. And I'll send them a prayer te text. And then I tell them, now you pray. While I'm praying, you pray as well. We're going to pray this thing together. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a bomb scare at the Otis Baby campus. Uh, mm -hmm. They put them on lockdown. She mm -hmm. goes to an HBCHU, mm -hmm. and that's a historical black uh, university and college. And she got scared. What we do? We pray. Mm -hmm. That's all we can do, baby. We pray. Mm -hmm. She leaves out in the morning to catch a bus that's on campus to take her to the other side of campus. I say. Do not have those headphones in your ear. You need to be able to hear everything around you and your surroundings. Everything 360, you need to be able to hear. Yes, yes. I, I so that's all I got. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's honestly, that's all I have is, is, is to pray because some, some things we just don't understand. Some things we don't have the language. That's why I asked Tam specifically because both of you got ladies because I know you have, I'm not sure. Antoine, do you have um, young teenage children in your I have family? Teen, I have teenage nephews. I, okay. I'm not a father yet. Okay. And the way things going, I'm not in a rush either. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Yes, but I, I definitely, like I said, the conversation that we, the goal of the conversation today is the fact that I, I just wanted us to visit then and now um, and to just really put an understanding on the fact is that we have fought a good fight, but we still must continue. And the one thing that I uh, want to ask and last in closing out um, this uh, uh, inequality and disparities is what is your wish for yourself in, 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 in the black community? What is your wish that your one gift that you would want to have that they would give us in a black community? I'll start with you, Antoine. The one wish I, I wish they give us in the black community, the same opportunities they give to everybody else. Prime example, you go to college, they give you loans. You want to start a business, got to have good credit, got to have this, got to have that, got to have that. But some other races don't have to have those requirements. Just give us the same opportunities. Amen. And Ms. Angie? Brother Antoine hit it on the nail. Hmm. I want the same 
thing across the board in all communities for all people, everybody to be, uh, to have access to the same thing. Yes. Uh, the neighborhood over in Eaglewood. I want it to look like the neighborhood over here in Bronzeville. You know, mm. same thing. I want the same thing across the board. I want the, uh, the schools over here in uh, Park Manor to be like the schools over on what in West Town. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. The same thing for, for my people. We're all the same. Yes. In God's eyes, we're all the same people. Yes. And so we shouldn't have to be judged differently or be succept susceptible to different things in life. Yeah. Why? Okay. Just from the color of our skin, exactly. And Ms. Tam, your answer to that, what would be your wish? I would agree with the, with the panel and I would add also to, to that is to give us back our knowledge, give us back our true education, give us back our wisdom, give us back those keepings that our ancestors had in order to, to, to know the gifts of life. Give us back our, our knowledge and our wisdom also. Yes, yes. And so we're gonna end there and I would like to thank all of our panelists today, including uh, Darren. And again, I am glad that we had this time to just talk and like I said, just touch the service because, you know, when you look at it, we were fighting for public transportation, we were fighting for housing, we were fighting in the civil rights, I'm sorry to make to make note of that, um, we were fighting for housing, we were fighting for education, um, and so much more, we're still fighting, we're still fighting, and I just truly pray that we will have the gumption, we will have the courage, and we will have the, the just the, the tenacity and wisdom to continue to want to fight that like Tam said earlier, that one day we will overcome to some degree, that, that, that is still, that will justify all of the things that we have lived through and still are living with, that one day, it will be Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King's speech one day, <laughs> you know, his kids will not be judged by the color of their skin. One day, none of us will be. And, and, I, and I hope and pray. And like, I'm like, Tam, I'm very hopeful. And, and I, I trust in God all the day long. But faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And it's sometimes we can't see it. Sometimes we don't know that God is going to take us down that path and journey. But I do pray that one day we will see the difference and we will know the difference before we leave this earth. So once again, I thank everyone, Antoine, Angela, Tam, and Darren. And again, this is for Daryl Speaks. Uh, we appreciate you viewing this and we ask that you just get included and view this and give your own comments and comment on our Facebook page and comment on the Federal Online Speaks page. Hey, give us your ideas. We thank you and we appreciate you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. You did an awesome job, Delisha. Yes, you awesome. did. You yes, did, did. Delisha. Yes, you, you held it down, you did, girl. You, held, you did that thing. Shut the door to the